Hello, this is Catherine, as I know I need to stop talking. Hello, lovelies, how are we doing? It's very cold, isn't it? I mean, it's February, obviously, it's very cold. But yeah, it's ridiculously cold. I feel like I've spent most of today feeling very cold. More on which shortly. Anyway, breaking news. Fucking finished dry January. Fucking yeah, woo, yeah, me. What a twat, what a twat. Who does dry January? Every time I talk about the fact I'm doing dry January, and everybody's like, but it's the most depressing month of the year. Yes, yes it is. And do you want to know the way to make the most depressing month of the year even more depressing? Do dry January. That's my, my top tip. But no, completed, I do feel terribly, terribly smug and virtuous. Although I clearly can no longer be trusted to have a single alcoholic drink at all. Because last night, Mr. I know I need to stop talking, was out with a friend and so sat myself down in front of the front of the football, more on which shortly, and thought, I'll have a glass of wine. Poured myself a glass of wine. Had to stop after about half a glass of wine because I was like oh, I think I'm going to need to go and have a, a little, lie, little lie down. It's like when, you, when you're a teenager and you have that, that first drink, obviously a teenager of 18, because underage drinking is illegal and wrong. Yes, good. Glad to get that health and safety warning in there. Um, but, but yeah, I, I was absolutely, yeah, it was, it was, it was a bit much. I'm, I'm too old for any of this shenanigans, basically. Far too, far too old for any of that nonsense. But the theme of this week's podcast is most definitely football. And for non-football fans, don't worry, because it will be like my version of football. So it's not like this isn't just in case you're listening to think of this and thinking, have I wandered into an episode of Football Focus? No, no, you have not. And how and how much you have not will become immediately apparent as I attempt to describe football to you and 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 fail misery. No, it's, there's some stuff on football and there's some other stuff we'll talk about as well. The cat story for you as well. So football football and cats hopefully you know something something for everybody that's that's a venn diagram that that pleases me greatly venn diagrams it's one of those things isn't it that you learn to do at school and we reference venn diagrams a lot but but when in when in life is there an actual requirement to use a venn diagram actually possibly as i'm saying that possibly there is a a, a need for a venn diagram when it comes to putting down everybody's choices for dinner and it's going to be one of those dick venn diagrams where nobody's fucking choices overlap even slightly because that'd be far too fucking convenient anyway where were we Football, good, excellent, structure and focus as pronounced as ever. So this morning, the reason I'm so fucking cold is because it's very fucking cold when you're standing on the sidelines of a football match inappropriately dressed, which, you know, clearly is my, is my modus operandus. So Beth and her team had a cup semi-final this morning. It was genuinely quite exciting. I was genuinely quite excited. I think actually I was possibly mostly excited by the fact that it has had the halcyon kickoff time of 12 noon. 12 noon! Any other sporting mums or dads out there will appreciate that feeling when you get the notification through and you realise that you're not going to have to be up and out of bed by 7.30 on a Saturday morning. Oh, it's it's like they've won the fucking cup final already. It's like, yes, I'm here, I've made it. But yeah, 12 noon kickoff, which was lovely. And unusually for Beth, she was actually, there was actually kind of a bit of fighting spirit about this. I mean, Beth, as long as she's playing football, doesn't usually give a shit. Like, win or lose, she's like, you know, I've played football. But there was kind of like this real, this real focus. So I, I said to her this week, I kind of like, I was imagining myself as like a, you know, a Terry Venables, showing my age there. But, you know, I was like in a Terry Venables, like, like, you know, sort of, right then, so let's talk about your match, darling. And, you know, talk to me, what's your strategy? And I was expecting her maybe to talk about her positioning or how she was going to control the ball or how they were going to play as a team together. And she looked at me like I was an absolute fucking moron, which to be fair is not an unusual experience. And she said, I'm going to beat the hell out of them. Good. Excellent. I'm sure that is the strategy Terry Venables said to the squad of Euro 96. Right then, lads, plan for this game. Beat the hell out of them. But yeah, she was she was all fired up. We got to the game. I always then have my, I, 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 you know, there's not many things that I excel at in life, but I feel that probably the area that I most excel at, gen, genuinely, if there was awards for this, I would win all of the awards. Because when it comes to embarrassing parent award, I, I am like so good. Like maybe, actually, maybe I should write that parenting book. Maybe I should write the How to Be an Embarrassing Parent book because I, I'm pretty certain my kids would testify for this. I could tick every fucking box there is, embarrassing parent. So we got to the, the game today and, and Beth is generally mortified by me, which I think is a bit harsh when it comes to football because I am not one of those parents. And we all know those parents. And if you're one of those parents, we love you dearly. But we all know those parents who get very emotionally over invested in their child's match or game or whatever sport, race, whatever it might be. And 
is very vocal as a result. I'm not that parent, partly because Beth has threatened me so violently I'm too scared to be that parent. But no, I'm, I'm not, I'm genuinely not, I'm not that parent. But nevertheless, Beth finds new and varied ways to be embarrassed by me every week. And I discovered to my delight a few weeks ago that one of the things she was most concerned I might do at one of her matches would be to volunteer as lines person, because now she's playing in nine versus nine formation. The offside rule comes into play. Now, I would like to say that I defy all of the nonsensical gender stereotypes out there. I know exactly what the fucking offside rule is. I know exactly how it works. But however many times I attempt to explain this to Beth, even as I'm watching a match on television and successfully calling out when somebody's offside, Beth's like, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I said, why? Clearly, you know that I know the offside rule. You know that I know how to run the line. She raised her eyes to the heavens. She said, because you're just so embarrassing. And I am. I am so good at being embarrassing. So now we like to play up on this. So today, one of the girls in her team came running over and somebody was selected to run the line and, and it wasn't me. And then I was kind of like, you know, waxing lyrical on how embarrassed Beth would be if I ran the line. So all of the parents, of course, because this is what you do, you like to collectively embarrass your kids. They were like, why don't you take the flag and pretend you're going to run the line? So I did. I got the flag. Fucking love a flag. And at the moment that Beth looked over, I waved it dramatically in the air. I'm doing really good actions right now. Somebody said that I should video my podcast. And usually I think, no, it would be pointless. It's just me talking into a microphone. But for today's episode, maybe we do need a video. I was waving this flag dramatically in the air. I like to think somewhere in a cross as though I was flagging down aeroplanes and auditioning for the Bolshoi Ballet. I was giving it all. I did a twist. I did a step ball change. Really, you don't just want one flag on the line. You want two flags on the line. Or why stop at two? You could have four flags, six flags. And yeah, so Beth, Beth turned around and I, and I was like, you know, sort of saying again, I feel like lines people, like they, they play down their role because, you know, you could have like big dramatic, I mean, you'd have different coloured flags, couldn't you? You could have glow in the dark flags for games at night. I've just thought that maybe I'll go on Dragon's Den and present glow in the dark flags for lines people. Oh my goodness, I just this is just going to be amazing. And I was like, and also they're quite quiet, the Lions people, and I would be standing there going, OBJECTION! Now I do know that objection is not something that you typically say in a football game, but why not? Why not if a decision is made badly? OBJECTION! I would be so good. Needless to say, Beth was both livid and mortified simultaneously. And so reluctantly, I handed the flag back to its rightful owner, but I would have been fucking brilliant, I tell you, and I'm determined before the end of the season, I am going to run the fucking line and I'm going to be brilliant. Anyway, there is nothing like a relaxing game of football, and this was fucking nothing like a relaxing game of football. Oh my goodness me. So playing a very, very good game, 9v9, is a team the girls have played previously. They won that last game 2-0, but it was very, very tight and very close. And their opposition came out absolutely storming today. So Beth's team got an early goal, so it was 1-0 at half-time. Beth, because they were without their striker, Beth had been asked to play up front. Beth was livid. And you'd think, but surely that's an amazing accolade to, to play up front. No, Beth, I mean, I appreciate none of you who ever met Beth, but hopefully I give her an accurate sort of description of what Beth is like. Beth is all about the fight. She is all about the battling. She's all about the shoving elbows and knees and physical and getting the fucking ball and instead her coach repeatedly had to remind her Beth up front and you stay up front and you wait for the ball to pass through which was highly entertaining because she spent literally 98% of the match looking absolutely fucking livid so yeah one nil at half time and then we came back after half time and unfortunately for the other team just because it's a shit thing to happen nobody wants to do it they accidentally handballed in the box so we got a penalty our team captain playing in defence, cool as you like, stepped up, slotted this penalty home, absolutely smashed it. So, boom, 2-0 up. Now, I've watched many football games in my life, so clearly, at this point, you never sit back and relax and think, oh, this is going to be absolutely fine, because invariably, it's never goes smoothly, and, and thus it was in, in this morning's game. The other team kept fighting, they were absolutely brilliant, they just had so much energy, so much determination, they came back, it was 2-1, they scored another goal, it was 2-2, and we're like, fuck, we couldn't get the ball up front, Beth's looking increasingly more livid, they've realised, the other team, that Beth is livid, so every time she gets the ball, and she's very fast with the ball, she had like two or three defenders on her practically bundling her, I'm like, oh my god, she's going to punch somebody, she didn't, but you know, the fear was real. And we're thinking, fuck, it's going to go to penalties. It's going to go to penalties, isn't it? And then 30 seconds from time, one of our incredible wingers on Beth's team just ran up the wing and just curled the ball in for the most beautiful goal. And we all cheered and the, they went back to, to the midway point and then it, the whistle went and that was it. And so we won 3-2 and oh my goodness, delighted though I was that Beth's team had won. My heart was a little bit broken for all those amazing girls who played so well the other time at the side and they were in tears and I'm sure Arla would have been in tears. 
except for maybe Beth because she was so, so absolutely livid. I went over and her coach said, well done, you didn't make that easy for yourselves, understatement of the fucking year. And then I was like, well done, you're a cup finalist. And she was like, I am so pissed off. And I was like, okay, cool. That's a, that's a good, good response to this. And yeah, true to form, she was livid that she'd had to stay up front and not punch people. I think, think that was the gist of her, of her fury. So yeah, proud mum moment. They are, they are in the cup final, which they absolutely will, will not win. Clearly, this is why I won't ever be a sporting coach, because I should say, of course, you've got as good a chance as anybody else, but the team they're up against are amazing and will win. But just to be a cup finalist, that's pretty amazing. And I bet you anything, there are a few teams who have won the cup semi-final and looked as livid as, as Beth did. She was furious. But it's been, it's been a tense football weekend all round, because of course, for, and again, I promise not to bang on too much about football. I appreciate you haven't come here for a football podcast just as well, really. But last night, obviously it's the FA Cup weekend, so last night it was Middlesbrough versus Man United, which was on the telly. Brilliant football on a Friday night. What an absolute win. Now, again, some of you who are long-time blog readers will know because there seem to have been a number of you who've like magically infiltrated the blog and genuinely, my dad and I did not know that this many other Middlesbrough supporters existed, but it seems that you do. Up the borough. There we go. You see, I've learned the lingo. Up the borough. And I was indeed supporting borough last night because, you know, it's Man United, sorry if you're a Man U fan, but as a Liverpool supporter through and through, I feel, you know, justified in, in perhaps not supporting Man United. And of course, my dad's been a, been a Borough supporter all his life. So yeah, I was absolutely going, yeah, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. And, and clearly it was very unlikely that Middlesbrough were going to beat Man United. But for anyone who didn't see the game, in the end, the massive underdogs held it to a one-all draw and then like did the most insane display of penalties ever to the point that I reckon the Middlesbrough manager must have said to his team like a couple of months ago lads there's no way that we're going to beat Man United in normal time take it to a draw and then all we're going to do is practice penalties for two months and it paid off they were tremendous but it's very tense it's very tense even as a non-Middlesbrough supporter it was very tense and my dad and I were ex exchanging whatsapp messages throughout it when we suggested that he might just go outside and, and, and go and cut down the honeysuckle rather than watching that, which was referenced to many years ago when we were living at home when I was a kid. There was a game, I think it might have been a rugby match, and I think England did badly. And I always remember that because the game finished, and my dad's a very, very calm man, never never shouts, you know, never shows heightened emotions. We got to the end of the game, he said, right, he said, I'm going out. And I thought, like, maybe he was going to the pub or to see his mates. But no, he went into the front garden where we had this huge honeysuckle bush that needed taking down. And he hacked down the honeysuckle, which I think was probably just because that was a job that needed doing when the rugby was over. But in my head, it's become synonymous with your team does badly, go find a honeysuckle to hack down. And he did. And he did. And then after all that, the cup games keep coming. And then Jamie, for his sins, is a West Ham supporter. And for anybody who didn't watch the football, or as I say, is, is just not into football altogether, West Ham were 1-0 were down to Kidderminster, a much, much lower side. And then they levelled one all. And then in the final 15 seconds of extra, extra time, West Ham scored and won 2-1. Anyway, that's quite fucking enough about football, but suffice to say, it's a good job dry January has finished. I might try another half a glass of wine tonight. I feel like I need it. Away from football, my cats are dicks. My cats are dicks, my cats are dicks. I mean, they are fucking funny though. So, so last night, after my half a glass of wine and the Middlesbrough game going to penalties, so it was quite late for a Friday night for me, it was, you know, I was getting to the point where I was like, I'll be tired tomorrow. It's gone 11 o'clock, I'll be tired tomorrow. I'm such a nana, I love it. Um, I'd gone up to bed and Mr. I know I need to stop talking had fallen asleep next to me. And I was just in that thing of like, you're just falling off to sleep. When I heard the most colossal bang from the end of our bed, I sat up and obviously the, the room is quite dark, but we have a street light not too far from our window outside. We never shut our curtains. I don't know if this is weird. People often tell me that I'm weird. I don't think it's weird. I like to see the sky in the morning and at night. I appreciate it's dark at this time of year. And if I'm in bed, then my lights aren't on, so nobody's going to see in my room. I never shut my curtains. Is that weird? I feel like you're going to tell me it is. About as weird as me not liking cheese. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Fucking grim. Cheese. Ah. Anyway, where were we? Noises in the middle of the night. So heard this enormous bang sat up in bed and Brexit the absolute twat again new listeners we have three cats sandwich ASAP and Brexit because we like to make ourselves look like dicks when we're shouting our cats names out and the neighbours are looking at us slightly slightly oddly Brexit had managed to jump up on the cabinet at the end of our bed which has the tv on it she's not the most coordinated of cats there's like this 
you know, I, th I think cats get stereotyped, right? I can't, I can't believe I've even said that sentence. I think cats get stereotyped, but I do think cats get stereotyped because when you think about cats, they're these lithe, lean, graceful creatures that leap from surface to surface and always fall on their feet. And indeed, most cats do. But then you get cats like Brexit, who's just a fucking klutz. She really is. And so I think last night, what she was trying to do was to jump from the cabinet to the windowsill, but she she missed. And she she plummeted from the cabinet instead of getting onto the windowsill she plummeted from the cabinet this was the crash i'd heard and fell into one of our laundry bags which was empty which we had at the bottom of the cabinet so i'd like heard this bang i sat up in bed and i was like you know then kind of moving to see if everything was okay and then i realized that there was something fighting furiously to get out of the inside of the laundry basket and that's how I found myself at almost midnight trying to rescue a cat from the inside of a laundry basket. My life is not very normal, it really is and I hope yours is weird too. Weird lives are good, I mean who wants to be normal right? Who wants to be normal? Which is kind of like a good segue, not the normal bit because there's, there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing normal about this podcast at all. That segue is nicely because it reminded me because we were talking about my dad being a middle supporter. It's all right, there's no more football. But the cat bit reminded me, my dad went through a phase, which in my head this all happened in the same week. And I don't think that it did. But when retelling it, it makes a great story if we imagine that it did. But certainly it was over a not particularly elongated period because I do remember all three of these incidents were referenced in our annual Christmas letter you know the ones where you write well most most families write lovely great big missives about how my child prodigy has already got a PhD from Oxford and he's only in the womb you know the kind of things well instead my my family we wrote about incidents such as this Our, ours was a slightly unique style of Christmas letter so in the course of this year, my dad had, had had three months. We'll assume this was his midlife crisis. He's going to come and do the podcast at some point. So when he does, we'll, we'll reference these incidents. And if you ever meet him, you should definitely, definitely reference them. But he got up one morning and went to put his dirty clothes from the night before into the wash basket and put them in and wondered what was wrong, like stared at it for a while, like what is wrong with this picture? What was wrong with the picture was instead of putting it into the wash basket, he'd put it into the object right next to the wash basket, which unfortunately for him was not a wash basket it was a toilet. So it was incident number one. Incident number two, on the cat theme, he got up one morning, he used to get up very, very early to, to commute, it was about a two hour commute into work for him. So he went downstairs, poured himself some breakfast cereal, sat down at the breakfast table, and again thought, what is wrong with this scene? Or more to the point, what is wrong with the smell? Because he'd gone into the cereal cupboard and he'd taken out the box of what he assumed was cereal, but owing to a very similar design by the manufacturers, possibly to trick such unsuspecting people as my dad, instead of pouring himself a nice bowl of bran flakes, he poured himself a nice bowl of Go Cat. Mmm, meaty fresh, just what you want at 6am in the morning. And then the last one, which is my favourite because it was witnessed, was... <laughs> <laughs> we live in a we live in a tiny tiny village um tiny village and my dad was one day walking it was a, probably saturday or sunday afternoon was walking down the drive to go and hoover his car so he was walking down the driveway and as he did one of our neighbors from across the road was on their drive and they stood out and they said hi dave and he said hello and she said you off to do the ironing and he went ha 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 and thought what's she on about she's mad and she went ha 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 in a slightly bemused looking way and then went back in her house and my dad unlocked the car and went to hoover it and suddenly realised why she'd looked at him slightly strangely because instead of bringing out the hoover he'd carried out the ironing board with him that's such a good mental image <laughs> off to do the ironing ha 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 what are you talking about you've got an ironing board in your hand you moron yeah I, d I don't know I don't know where that came from anyway that was that was more random things that that happened I am determined with the podcast this is like my little project I'm recording this unusually early for me on a Saturday, partly because I just can't do the whole Russian roulette with a cardo anymore. I mean, it's just like, you know, will they come? Will they not come? I mean, to be clear, a cardo will always come. We love a cardo, but I do tend to manage to time the recording of this podcast inconveniently with their arrival time. So I recorded it very early, but also because I'm determined off the back of some feedback on the blog this week, I want to work out how we can make these podcasts accessible to those people who can't hear or who struggle to hear, or even people who are just like me and are so bemused by life that they zone out whenever trying to take anything in through the spoken word. This is a true and very real problem of mine. But no, more seriously, for those people who are deaf or are hearing impaired, there must be a way to make this into a transcript, right? I mean, it's probably going to be quite a nonsensical transcript, but that's my aim for this afternoon. So if you are 
deaf or hearing impaired and you are reading this rather than listening to it, then yay, that means I've succeeded. And if you're not, then you'll have no idea that I've said this. But regardless, I would like you to know that it's something I absolutely am working on because it's just another one of those things, right, that in my position of privilege, I have never had cause to have to think about it. And it's quite right that people are going, well, no, actually for lots of us, this isn't an accessible form of media. So I am determined to make sure that it is. I will find a way of transcribing this, even if I have to type it up myself, which might end means it ends up being even more nonsensical than the podcast. We'll have to see what, see what happens there. Great excitement here. Jamie's girlfriend's just arriving. At least I assume Jamie's girlfriend's just arriving because I heard a yell of Jamie from outside the front door. So this is like, uh, yeah, you're live, live from my house where Jamie's girlfriend is arriving. Jamie's probably thinking, shut up, mum, stop being so embarrassing. Okay, we'll play it cool. We'll play it completely cool. I don't look very cool. I'm sitting here in the kitchen hysterically shouting about his girlfriend being here. But, you know, I will attempt to play it cool, to play it cool. Anyway, transcript. That's the project for later this afternoon. Other news, other news on what is already a rambling, nonsensical collection of thoughts. We're getting our loft converted. I want to say I'm really excited about this. And I'm excited about the concept of having a loft conversion. I am not excited about the process you have to go through to get to a loft conversion. We went to, this morning, we went to visit the builder who's going to do it and, and he looked around the loft conversion in his house that he has done. Always nice to see that somebody can actually do what you're going to pay them a vast amount of money to do. And his looked lovely. So in my head, I've kind of like optimistically fast tracked to the point of having a loft conversion in place. So you can expect to hear lots of first world problem moaning over the next couple of weeks while I basically bitch and moan about the fact. Next couple of weeks, look how optimistic I am, as if it's going to be a couple of weeks. Next half a year or so, you can expect to hear a lot of me complaining about the loft conversion that I'm very privileged to be having done, even though it will feel like an absolute ball ache at the time. From memory, we had our loft converted in our last house. From memory, I think loft conversions actually aren't too bad. The one that the, the household work, if you're, if you're ever going to get anything done to your house, this is the one to avoid. This is the big one. And, and every single person I talk to has the same views and same experience of this hell. It's when you get your kitchen done. If you ever have your kitchen redone, you are honestly better off going to live in a tent in a field somewhere to avoid the hell of getting your kitchen done. Now we, I think, exacerbated the whole experience because we at the time, we had a, it was a tiny, tiny little galley kitchen. Again, naively, I thought, there's nothing of it. How can it make a mess? Ha, 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 excuse me while I just sit here and rock hysterically. To be fair to the people who did my kitchen, I don't think it would have made as much of a mess as it ended up making because again back then I'm gonna say naive but let's be honest it was probably more stupid I left for work on the day they were starting work in the kitchen and I just just did not think there's no excuse I just did not fucking think and I came back home and obviously you know the old kitchen was knocked out and stuff and I was like oh this is cool and that was before I realized what a twat I hadn't even thought of doing something as sensible as I don't know shutting even a single one of the bedroom doors. There was dust fucking everywhere, literally everywhere for, I think it was only a two week job. There was dust fucking everywhere. We had a six month baby, six month old baby, because again, what's the most stupid time to get your kitchen done? Oh, I know, let's pick a time when you need to use a fucking microwave steriliser every single day and you've got a baby and fuck my life. I will always remember feeding Jamie because we were just weaning him there and I always remember feeding him some porridge and going, this porridge looks particularly grey. And then like I tasted some and it wasn't porridge, it was dust. Well, it was porridge and just like made him a bowl of, <laughs> made him a bowl of dust. What sort of parent do you think I am? But I kind of had, cause there was so much dust. The dust had gone in with the porridge and porridge is quite dusty everywhere. And everything was fucking dusty and oh, fucking hell. Like I say, hashtag first world problems. But yeah, if you are planning to get your kitchen done at any point, my advice is to move out first, preferably to like the moon or somewhere where you won't have to have any interaction with it whatsoever. So loft conversion probably will take four months in a house with two children, two adults and three fucking batshit cats. What could possibly go wrong? Bets on which of them is the first to leave footprints in cement. I mean, it's it's going to be like about 30 seconds after the builders get here, isn't it? Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I'll be, I'll be the Sarah Beanie of podcasting. That's unfair to Sarah Beanie. She is competent. I think what we've proved of nothing else so far in this podcast is I am very definitively not. Other exciting news is I'm getting a smart meter. 
I don't think I really want a smart meter, but my energy company told me I was going to get a smart meter. I don't really know what a smart meter is. I mean, I hope it's fucking smart, given that with the energy increases. I mean, this is bad, right, isn't it? This is like, this is proper, I'm properly, I properly sat up and was worried about this because, you know, don't get me wrong, big price increases aren't easy for, for anybody to swallow, but for some households, this is like the difference between being able to heat your home or feed your kids or even have a home at all. I mean, fucking ha this genuinely, this genuinely really scares me. I what can we do? Like, does anybody know practically, if you have good tips of things, how can we help those people who are going to be most badly impacted? It's like those those who are on prepay meters are going to be, I think, not protected by some of the, the cost savings that the government's putting on us. Like, how can we help these people? Obviously, donate to the food banks and, and that's what we do. But is there more we can do? I was thinking of their dedicated charities for this. Can you offer to fund somebody else's bills for a bit? I like, yeah, if anybody's got any suggestions, like genuine, I know this is mostly a very light-hearted and bonkers podcast, but this shit scares me. This really, really scares me because there's going to be like families and, and kids, there'll be kids like in the kids' schools who, yeah, they're, they're going to be cold or they're going to be hungry or they're potentially not going to have a house at all. Fucking hell, it's such a fucking mess, isn't it? So so all, all joking aside, if you have any any health suggestions, I might do a blog post about this as well. I'd, I'd love, love, love to hear them. I'd love to know how we can how we can help, where can I donate, but also how can we raise awareness and help those who who need it. Maybe we just do need to go ahead and make Beth Prime Minister. She'll probably fit it in, in between her, her football. For, for anybody who didn't see on the blog this week, Beth's, Beth's new idea, my, um, my results of my smear test came and, you know, very lucky and very grateful that it's an all clear. And so I was showing Beth in an attempt to demystify generally, I was just showing Beth the, um, the letter that came. She looked at it, she said, is that what you get when you have a smear test? I said, yeah, what were you expecting? She went, well, based on what you've told me, you should get a trophy at least. And I was like, yes. Yes, you fucking should. Yes, you fucking should get a trophy. And then she turned around because she's nothing if not a multitasker and went, well, I'm going to make sure that everybody gets trophies. And those trophies are going to be made from the plastic that people have dumped in the oceans so we can give trophies for smear tests and we can clear up our oceans at the same time. And that is the kind of joined up policy thinking that this fucking government can only dream of. Beth, 4 p.m. As a complete aside, but this has made me howl with laughter, I put this anecdote onto Instagram today and a lady replied, and properly weeping with laughter, to say that she doesn't get trophies when she has her smear test, disappointing, but the surgery she goes to or, or is part of, they have some stickers that they can give to patients, which I think were donated by a nearby dentist, so lots of her friends have had these stickers, but one, and I so hope this is a true story because it's fucking genius, one lady went for her smear test and got given a sticker <laughs> that said, no word of a lie, congratulations for opening wide. And that is what we should print on all the fucking trophies. Congratulations for opening wide. It's a key part of our manifesto. Trophies for smear tests, it's, it's the future. Right, I'm gonna go and research transcripts and try and be like the cool mum that says hi to Jamie's girlfriend. Well, I think we've established if nothing else from today's podcast, I am indisputably embarrassing mum through and through. I hope you're all okay. I hope you're keeping safe and well. Look after yourselves. I will see you next week. Lots of love. Bye-bye.